one. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. All right, let's see if we can keep this mic working. Ooh, it's a magic mic. Okay. I'm really excited about our class today. We really have a lucky treat, a guest in our class. And let me try to orient how I met this guest. So, last summer, I went to the Long Beach Comic Con. Are you familiar with what a Comic Con is? Yes, okay. So I went to the Long Beach Comic Con, my first one ever, and had this amazing experience of seeing all this art, all these comics and uh, amazing artistic interventions in this space. And it was there that I had the opportunity and the true pleasure of meeting um, our guest today, Derek Lipscomb. I met him uh, and his partner as they were uh, tabling to highlight this amazing creative intervention, this comic book called The Maroon. Right, The Maroon. Did you receive a copy from me? Yes, okay. So, uh, we began to chat and I learned uh, that though Derek is from the East Coast, from New England, he resides here in California and began working on this project. Right. So, this is a really important story to hear because he began thinking about writing comics and drawing comics at age four. Right? How many of us have maintained our dreams from age four? Exactly, <laughs> right? They often, of course, change, but to actually get to follow through on these desires that we have as young children is really pretty amazing. So, um, without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Derek to speak. Uh, I've got some questions, and of course, you received uh, the comic, and then hopefully we can also get, for those of us who haven't had the opportunity to read it yet, can get more oriented in the story, The Maroon, right? The different uh, copies that come out. I, I only have copies one through three, but Derek has a table of their copies one through six that are out now. Right, so we can hear more about this story of The Maroon. So let us welcome him. Derek, let's go. How many people like comic books? How many people really like this? Anyone that like David Reader? No? You? You got a favorite series? Sorry, I like the flash. Um, I, yeah, I always wanted to do comics when I was four. Um, it started because my brothers would say comics laying around the house. They were a great escape. Uh, they were something to do when it was a rainy day to read. And then my brothers, both of them are artists. Um, the middle one's a musician, the oldest one's a, you know, he's in fine arts now. But they used to take paper and fold them up and draw their own comic book heroes. And he gave the little brother, I wanted to copy them, so I did it. And then they grew out of it, and I didn't. And I'm still a kid, apparently, I'm 44. So um, as I got older, I, I kind of honed my craft, learned everything I could. Uh, went to a lot of conventions, went to a lot of stores, a lot of books. Um, I moved out here in 92, and, um, and that's when I really started actively pursuing this as a glorified hobby, if you will. Um, this particular book, I, I had put out a, a series prior to that. I worked with someone else. We did kind of a comedy book. It was called Poverty Back. Um, that was a mild success, but I decided at one point I was going to go and break off into my own. And so I had uh, this kind of uh, epiphany when I was exploring my ancestral roots because on my mom's side of the family, everybody was saying, oh, you're Native American, you're Native American. And uh, of course, you hear that all the time. If you're African American, you don't know for sure. So uh, I wanted to, to investigate. And there's not a lot of information out there because your family lineage only goes so far back and there's no paperwork or nothing that works sometimes People are listed as mulatto, and it's not accurate. And then I started reading articles where people are like, everybody says it, that doesn't mean it's true. You can just have a lot of European blood in you. <coughs> so I was really curious about what was the ratio between the half Native American, half African American uh, peoples here in America. And that's when I came across this book that was called uh, Black Indians. Uh, and in it, they detailed uh, these, uh, this little known part of history. 
as I was learning about all these things, I started thinking about on the comic side of my brain how great it would be to have a character that was culled from that era. Someone that was larger than life, though, I kind of wanted to do something in the, in the lines of maybe like a Zoro or a Lone Ranger type. But there was nothing that looked like me that was in that realm. So I just said, I'll create that. And so this is where the character of the Maroon sprouted up. He is a nameless black seminal. He's on the run from the law because he is being accused of a crime that he may or may have not committed. He's not sure because he's a little bit amnesia. Um, rather than just making it a straight, and, and it's in 1850s America, so there's a lot of history that's embedded in here, but also to kind of uh, embellish it, I added a lot of fantastical elements to supernatural. There's characters from folklore. I mixed it all in there just to give it something a little more spicy. So this is where I've been doing this. I uh, actually started this a year from this month uh, ago. And I'm on issue six right now, and I'm about to collect all these into one uh, trade. And that's where I am. So um, that's really it. Can you um, orient for us who, what is a maroon? OK, so a maroon is basically a name designated to an escaped slave, primarily from the Caribbean, um, usually Jamaica or uh, any of those islands, Haiti or, or so. Um, but it's bled over into the South America, uh, Southeast, and like in Florida. So when someone would escape, and they they would hold up with the Seminoles, they would also sometimes be called the Maroon. And that is what he is called by pretty much everybody that tries to take him in because they don't know what else to call him, basically. And I like that because it gave him kind of an air of mystery. He has no name. He's this figure that just shows up. You don't know anything about him. You don't know what he's capable of. And I think that makes it engaging uh, personal. So that's where that came from. And, and throughout the history, there's, there's a lot of, um, as I found out, there's a lot of short stories and things that were uh, based on maroons, both fictional and non-fictional. Uh, but they're really, you really have to dig around and find these type of things, so. Are there questions? Yes, okay. Yes. Are you working on any other uh, comics or any other plans? Um, at the moment, this is the only one I have. Um, that's all I have time for. I'm, I have a, a three-year-old girl, and I'm married, I have a full-time job. So juggling it, it's already, you know, there's no sleep. So this is where I am doing that. And it's a, obviously, it's a, a passion of mine. Uh, so I'm willing to sacrifice whatever free time I have when I'm at work, whether it's break time, I'm drawing, I'm writing, I'm scanning it in, I'm coloring it, and I'm doing whatever I can to just move this forward. So I've been fortunate enough to release these bi-monthly, so every two months a new issue usually comes out. But um, as at this point, while I'm trying to get the, the collected trade together, there'll probably be a slight hiatus before I start continuing the story. So, yes? What's your job? I'm a graphic designer. I had to rationalize, because I was so uh, determined to be an artist, and I knew that artists usually only get rich after they die. Uh, <laughs> I had to find something that was a little middle of the road where can I be creative and still make a living? So graphic design kind of was that answer for me. Yes? I think they had a pretty good time because thanks to Black Panther and uh, projects like that, the black comic book uh, writer is going to do damn well. Correct. Uh, that's, I keep getting a lot of that from people who, who see that, and it's, it's a great time uh, to be in any realm of diversity in the comics because also not only just Black Panther is great for aspiring black artists, uh, you have characters like Wonder Woman who open the door for women, and there's so many other facets that haven't been explored or being explored in independent comics, which is, you know, we call this indie comics because it's, it's not uh, the mainstream. And a lot of those titles that I was reading as a kid became more violent, became more dark, had more sex, you name it, everything in there, it became more engaging as the older I got. So this is where this all kind of comes full circle for me. Uh, any other questions? Yes. <laughs> Why this era? So you say, uh, so 1850s, if you trace it back to this black Indian myths and yeah. Seminoles. Right. So in, in theory, you could have explored any time. So right. Why go back to the 1850s, uh, prior to the end of slavery, prior to the Civil War? Why then? I don't feel like it's explored enough. And I think also, and this kind of comes from my mom, my, my parents. 
that's an area nobody wants to really talk about because of the, you know, the, what the ties are with it for us. And I, instead of, you know, I, I wanted to confront it head on in a way. So what was life like back then? You know, how were people talking to you? It just seemed like an interesting thing to go through because, you know, the, I could have done this superhero thing, but it's been done to death, and how many ideas are going to be fresh and new? I could have done something that was futuristic, but you really have to, you really have to have that, that, that right ingredient to make that work, because, I mean, that's another thing that can be done to death, and you have to have that unique spin on it. Uh, this was just a thing that I felt like, at the time, I was feeling the whole, um, yeah, the whole, uh, what do you call it? The whole, like, you know, like I said, the Zorro, the, um, the Graham Adventurer, John Henry's, you know, things like that I wanted to further explore because there's not enough of, you know, someone like me represented in that, that arena, and especially in a, a positive spin. So, you know, I wanted to do that too, make something that was more of a positive character, uh, who's coming out of a, a negative situation and how he turns that around. So it is very much a hero's journey. He starts off uh, very doubtful of who he is, and he just wants to be left alone. But as he begins to progress through his journey across the, st the states, he, uh, he makes a decision for himself that he wants to do better. So um, the next volume will be a, a completely different feel to it uh, as we move forward. It's just as uh, the series ends on this one. So, is there any other questions? Yes? What's your favorite comic series on Blackpool? Well, see, I'm an old school comic freak. So, I started reading comics in the 80s, and I started with Iron Man, because Iron Man was cool to me. I always liked the way he looked, and I knew he was Tony Stark. But when I picked up the, my very first copy, it was a really cool cover, it has him on the front, firing his repulsors, and I'm reading it, and discovering that it's not him, it's his black friend Jim Rose, that's Iron Man. Because he took over the role while Tony Stark was fighting alcoholism. So he was Iron Man for a number of years, and I thought that was really bold, because then it's like, it was unheard of, like who was gonna, you know, was gonna take over our main character like that and give him that spotlight. So I was hooked on that, and then I went to West Coast Avengers. Um, I got into the Secret Wars. I was a big Marvel fan in the 80s. And in the 90s, I got into DC, and I like Flash. I have a large Flash collection, uh, Justice League, uh, you name it. Um, dipped into Image a little bit, got into Spawn for a little bit. Um, and then I just started getting into more independent comics because I feel like their stories are a little more, um, I don't know, they're just they're more interesting. They're not, they're not cliche, and you can get shocked by some of them. A perfect example is The Walking Dead. That anyone that's watched that show, if you don't know, that's a comic series first, and that's it's just as brutal, if not more so, in the comic. So, yes. How is the publication process look like for you? Like, um, you know, well, the, the fact that there's like a lot of superhero stuff, there's a lot of futuristic stuff. Right. Like, um, what was it like for you trying to publish? Are you self-published? Well, luckily now, because I tried to get comic books out like in the 90s, and thanks to the digital age, we have this wonderful thing called um, Print on Demand. Whereas before you would have to go to Canada and find something affordable, and you'd have to order like a minimum of a thousand books, Print on Demand is a place in uh, Florida called Kablam. You can send, you can do all your artwork, send them new files, and they will, um, they will say how many books you want. I want 15 books, there's 15. Or I need you know, 200, and there's 200. So it makes it really easy to, to finance this and, and be someone that can sell books at a, a table at a convention. So when I do a convention, I'll bring a minimum of 20 to 50 books, and I'll usually sell about half there. Um, so it's been really, it's been really uh, a great experience so far. I'm really glad to have it. It's neat to meet everybody that's really into it and come by and, and check it out. And that's how I met her, and she keeps my table in and you know, all the ones I had available, so. I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> so, does anyone else have any questions? Yes? What's it like inhabiting a space that's not a stuff? 
Oh, you mean like being a black person in the comic books? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when I was younger, it was a little more like, you had to be like, like almost a closet thing. You had to be like, well, I like comics, but I'm not going to tell anybody. You know, but now, the arena is wide open now. You go and you see everybody. If you went to a comic convention, say, 15, 20 years ago, you would see the typical nerd, you know, the guy that didn't move out of the basement. And, and that was it, and there's a lot of B.O. And now you go, and it's like all the cool kids crash the party. You know, you have all these models walking around dressed up in cosplay, and you know, everybody just wants to be there because Hollywood has not been invasive in it. Um, it just San Diego Comic Con is the biggest example of that because it's not about comics anymore. It's really about the Hollywood machine. You go there, it's video games, it's statues, it's cosplay, and there's a little corner for comics right there. So even though that's the root of it all, that's what's happening in the, the larger arena. So I like to do tabling smaller conventions. Um, they're a little bit more where the, the true like the true fans come and they come and talk to you and they buy your books and stuff like that. So uh, anyone else? Yeah. Oh, better. Someone else is going though. No, no, I, um, um, how do you how do you battle that? Like this idea that <clears throat> comics are becoming more mainstream via film and that culture. Um, and yet, it sounds like you still have to like battle for the space for comics in, in those kind of Comic Con spaces. You do, but you don't. I mean, you have to have faith that, kind of like the stock market, things go up and then they come down, and things go up and sometimes they come down. So sometimes the mainstream arena, that right now is really powerful. I mean, you see how much money the Avengers is making, and everyone's all about that. But at some point, people are like, please stop with the superheroes, please. I mean, people already are like that. And, and so, like I said, I feel like other areas will be mined for ideas. And I feel like if you hang in there and you just peddle the idea, it'll eventually, you know, come through. I, I always felt like someone had asked me, well, how would you, what would you, would you like to see this be turned into a movie? And I said, I'd rather a TV series, just because it's episodic in nature. And doing a movie would truncate it and wouldn't make it, you know, it wouldn't be very true to what it is, in my opinion. So, yes. Did you like at the San Diego Comic Con sort of like the comic book push to the side? Right. Like with, with the film and all that, the characters and the idea of comics and having them on the line. Right. Do you see the film as sort of like the, the, the pushing aside and having the comic book be something That and video games, um, you name it, there's so many things that kids have. Um, to divert their attention today. When I was a kid, which is millions of years ago, um, comics were one of the few forms of entertainment we had. We had TV, when your parents kicked you out of there, you had to either figure out what to do outside or you could read a book. And now, um, they're obsolete now. You don't go into a, a liquor store and see the turnstiles where they, they used to have them. Now you have to go to a comic store and, and buy them there. So, yeah, I feel like movies is a huge detriment to it. You can think it would boost it, but in actuality, it's just that people have just turned to that to be their, their source of the stories instead of going, unless they have a lingering interest. So, yes? Is it like Hollywood influence, like, like made DC do like the new 52, and that's why I don't like just like the. Yeah, yeah. yeah they, so. Um, yeah, they kind of play with each other, I think. And I think DC was really trying to get themselves into the theater, and they haven't really succeeded that well, I think. So, yeah. uh, anyone else? Yes. I'm okay with that, honestly, because he, he was asking when Halloween comes around, how do I feel about young white kids dressing up as a black head? I think that's fine because when I was a young black kid, I wanted to dress up as Captain America. And I couldn't really do it because it felt weird. But I could put Spider Man on, no one knew who I was. I could do Iron Man because nobody knew because it was a whole head mask. But, you know, some characters you just couldn't play. And I don't have a problem with that. I mean, if it opens the doors for them to explore that character more, which is a great character, then yeah, by all means, you know, I, I'm all for that. You know, I don't feel like we should shut the door on anybody with anything. So. 
Yeah. No, 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 no. I wasn't saying that. If your kid comes out as Luke Cage, then I have a problem with that. <laughs> right, right. There's going to be something weird about that. So. But I mean, the costume itself, that's the main thing. That's, that's the draw from when you're a kid. That's what gets you into comics if you see these colorful costumes and stuff like that. And you want to look at look like that, and you know, Batman looks great. But then you put it on, and you're like, something's not right, you know? So. <laughs> You know, but that's that was a stigma from back then. I don't really feel like it's as bad now. And I'm glad. I'm glad that even kids today can just pick and choose to be whatever they want. You know. And then I scanned it in, and I uh, I cleaned it up in Illustrator and I colored it in Photoshop. Um, and then I do all the lettering in Photoshop, which is supposedly a no-no. I just found out, but has really you know ruined the book for me. So, uh, but a uh, book typically a book like that takes me about a month and a half to complete. Uh, as long as I have the time to do it. And I usually try to force that time in. Sometimes I'm at work and nobody's looking and I'm drawing. So <laughs> you just gotta make it work for you. So, um, anyone, anyone? You, sir. Uh, do you ever draw or write? Do you ever stop like that? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And sometimes I, I'll write around that. But um, for the most part, I'll try to visualize things in my head. Sometimes. I can't wait to write the script, so I end up just drawing the sequence, and that works out better. Because I, I think of things in a cinematic fashion. I don't, I don't borrow necessarily from other comic books. I borrow a lot from cinema, so I've had a lot of influence from cinema in this book. So, do you have a question? Um, what's the process like when you're trying to tell someone who's reading and kind of It was really difficult. I actually had to have someone I consulted with, kind of, kind of better handle on it. Um, because a lot of the dialogue started coming out too contemporary at times. And some of it is. So I call it a heightened history. It's history but with a lot of allowances in there. I mean, if you were going to say, oh, you know, this issue had a train in it, and the train didn't come until a year later, I had to kind of make it work so it fit the narrative. And the same thing with the way people speak. I kept it as close as I, as much as I have been exposed to. And I've, I've even done research online about what were common phrases back in 1850, insults, what were, you know, whatever. How did people flirt with each other? It's all in there, and it's awkward. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. Do you consider yourself more of a writer or more of an illustrator? Illus. How does that affect the way that you speak? Definitely an illustrator, because that's all I wanted to do when I was a kid. I wanted to break in and be a penciler. In fact, I actually went to um, audition at Marvel years ago, and they turned me down because I brought them everything. I brought pencils, like a page that was pencil colored, everything in ink. And I said, I, I want to work here. And he said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I just, I just want to work on a book. He said, yeah, but you got to show me, like, you, you want to be a penciler, you want to be an inker, you want to be a colorist. And I was like, a penciler, because that's the guy that dreams it all up. So he's like, OK, take the script. I want you to draw these pages and send it to me. And this is in 2000. So I went back to California. I was like, I'm going to work for Marvel. And I started drawing the Spider Man script. And I sent it to them. And just as they got it, Marvel went bankrupt. And they basically laid off everybody, especially my contact. So I never got that chance again. Because I had someone who actually was working that I knew who was married to a friend of mine. And she got my foot in the door. There's that. So um, that's my sob story. <laughs> for you to buy my book. <laughs> Feel bad for me, Dan. <laughs> uh, yes. Yes, I'm not too far from here. I've been with you. Um, and I usually do Long Beach Comic Con and the Expo. Um, I, I was going to do the, the one that was in Chino that just happened. But I try to keep conventions local. I haven't gotten to that point where uh, these are being sold nationwide other than what you can get online. So, yes. I was born in Rhode Island, and then I lived in Connecticut when I, during my school years. So after high school, my mom was like, we're getting out of New England, and we're going to California. So we drove cross country, and we landed here. So and I haven't looked back. So I think this place had me in mind when they designed me. So, yeah. Anyone else? If 
Who would be my, my favorite artists? Oh man, um, I'm all across the board. Uh, I like old school Carmen Infantino, the guy that first designed the Flash uh, outfit. I like uh, I liked Tom McFarlane for a while because he had a really wild style to him. And Jim Lee, of course, is very good. But then I also like the, the Hernandez brothers. They put out an indie book called Love and Rockets. And I like their style. It's set in a very punker LA, a black and white comic that's very clean and very graphic. So. Uh, I, you know, I just I find something in everything, and I don't I don't try to riff off of anybody too much. So, but you should always I mean, obviously, you should always have your influences to to put you where you are. And there's nothing wrong with uh, you know emulating those people like that. But in terms of storytelling, the cinema is what really moves the book for me. So you know, I'll watch movies that have really uh, interesting cinematography. And kind of use that as inspiration for how I, I set those the panels, what angle I see the characters for. Right so, and what else? Is everyone tired of hearing me talk? <laughs> what are the political implications of doing this comic, The Maroon? I mean, based in history, but what are the implications of producing this right now? Mm, you will get people who kind of look at it as. What kind of message are you trying? Are you going against what our government represents now? You know, um, it's just not. I mean, this wasn't intended to be a political book, but as you, as I was writing it, I realized in some ways you can't escape it because of the time period it was in. You have to address certain things, and I didn't want to dance around it too. Once I decided that, you have to just, you have to take a head on. Otherwise, it's not going to be, it's not going to be um, genuine. So. The, you know, like I said, you'll see it in the language that is used and how people treat this character, and um, it just his his for this for these six stories, he has to stay outside of basically uh, civilization in order to navigate the U.S. in 1850. Otherwise, he's going to get lynched or sold back into slavery or whatever. So he's mostly in the wilderness, and he encounters these pockets of people here and there. And there's people hunting him, and so. Um, those are some of the perils he faces. Um, I had to keep all that in mind. You know, I couldn't have him. You know, just be. Well, he's an exception to the rule. Everyone likes you. And come save us. You know. So no, that's not, not how this book works. So, yes. I like this too about the Sadly, that's only way young people look up Right, but right, right. And that being said, I do like that, but I also want it to be also entertaining. So I think entertainment is a great way of pulling somebody into that instead of making it a lecture and you know or pointing your finger at somebody. I want, and I'm, I'm and I I write everything very objectionable. So there's a villain that's being developed in this story, who is very much bent on getting this character, and he has reasons for doing it. And they said the best villains are the ones that have a motive where you can almost understand where they're coming from, but you just won't go the distance they're going. And that's how I try to develop this character. He shows up in issue two, and then he shows up somewhere else down the line. Oh, I won't spoil it for you. But he's going to be, in the future issues, somebody that's going to really mess with him a lot. So. So it's about 7.25. We actually have more time. But what I'm going to do now, I'm going to throw on some music. Um, you can please stay and linger. Uh, uh, Mr. Liscom is selling his comic books here. So if you can calm down and check them out, um, this is a great opportunity to actually see them here. Who knows when you'll make it to a Comic Con, but here you have access to it right here, right in your own class. So let's stick around. Um, medium, you can get comic book signs, uh, and they're at a good price. So. Thank you, everybody. I believe later. So it's not just cash only. Hope you take cards. What? It's not just a cash only world anymore. So don't let that stop. You got three hours and that's definitely I know how it is. <laughs>